Garth Harden. Hey, good evening, Garth. Good evening, my brother Shamaya. How's everything, sir? All is well, brother. How about yourself? I'm trying to hang in there as always, man. I'm trying to do what I do as always, man. <laughs> okay, okay. You trying or you doing? Well, I'm doing, yeah. I got to get rid of that word trying. I'm doing. <laughs> I'm yeah, yeah. Do. I'm, I'm doing the work. You're absolutely correct. And thank you for exactly because uh, I know you're the man for the plan. <laughs> <laughs> no question. No yeah. Question. So, yeah. I'm pretty uh, excited about this evening, uh, Garth. Oh, I, I'm I'm excited too. Um, this is um, I didn't realize. Um, I don't know if you've ever gone through a process in in your life where you. You do something and you never real you, you you didn't realize that you've actually come full circle on a, on something that you're working on. Like it was just like uh, amazing to me when I started recalling what my life has been uh, back in um, in the in the mid '80s when my, when my mother used to take myself and my siblings to Dr. Ben, and from that moment and the conversations myself and my siblings had to what we're about to talk about tonight is um, really interesting and fascinating just to come full circle. And I didn't realize it because it wasn't at least not consciously intended. I understand that. For those who are um, going to be listening to this recording later on that may not be familiar with Dr. Ben, uh, could you go into a little bit detail of who Dr. Ben is? Uh, Dr. Yosef ben Yakinen is the, I don't want to call him just the conscious community because that will be like a, uh, a, uh, 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 kind of diminishing his work, but he is a an, a, an educator, uh, a um, historian of uh, African history with a concentration in the areas of Egyptian history, ancient antiquity in um, on the continent Africa. And he's done so for a very long time. I think he's probably in his 80s now, like 85 years old now. Yeah, I believe but so, too. Yeah. You know, but he's a prolific um, researcher, historian, who, is, who have educated people of Hugh for uh, a very long time, myself included. So I, I got it early in the 80s when he had that vigor in his mind. He was very adamant. I don't know if you ever had an opportunity to see him um, in, in his heyday. I saw him over I saw him up in Harlem, but that was like in the um, mid nineties. Understood, understood. Yeah, very interesting individual, and I definitely could appreciate what he brought for. So, um, from that, from listening to him to uh, to where I'm at right now, it's really a fascinating thing because I, I would have never projected this from the eighties to now. Really, yeah. really, really, yes. It sounds exciting, and it sounds like um, you're like you bursting at the seams to uh, uh, educate us on human domestication. And um, I'm really curious about that myself. I know off um, off mic or off telephone, we talked about it, but um, I I really do believe for those that are open, they're going to be um, not only introduced to a treat, but they're going to be given a meal. Uh, with this human domestication, <laughs> and then I want, to, I also wanted to build on top of that because some ideas started coming to me as I was thinking about the whole um, the word phrasing human domestication. And uh, for those that are unfamiliar with that terminology or those words put together like that, what would be your basic or easiest way of um, to help people understand that? Uh, uh, human domestication theory and why I chose those words. Um, Oddly enough, although the the term and the phrase human domestication is exactly what it is, and, and, I, and I'll expound on that in just a moment, but I really want to uh, say this so those who will listen to this um, uh, conversation that we're having here this evening uh, can fully understand. This is really a conversation about respect, and um, I'm, and I'm going to expound on that a little bit later on. But human domestication is an idea, or any kind of domestication is an idea from something, whether it being a human being, an animal, but I'm really talking about an idea, 
a universal idea to create something. And whatever that something is, it creates it and then allows the ingredients within what is created to dictate the rules of engagement. And whatever the, that idea or source is, it kind, of, it kind of observes and then sets out the rules based on what it see, sees, based on the people who are kind of, or the organisms that are kind of molding what exactly the idea this source had and it wanted to express. And then all the components kind of figure out and go about their everyday lives of manipulating this system and then the source kind of uh, creates the rules based on how the people interact. And this is, a, this that, is something that, that happens all the time with even animals and humans as well, too. That's interesting. Now, when you say source, um, uh, I don't want to say something as mundane as, as God because it's not mundane, but how I'm interpreting, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the source is really this this metaphor, the medium that we live in or exist through us, the, the spirit realm energy. Is that what you're talking about or are you talking about something different? Oh, well, actually, it, all of those things are subsidiaries to, to whatever created this, you know, this universe, solar system, all of these things. So we can actually pick and choose from where we would like to start in order to describe the same thing. Um, okay. So you're not wrong in your in your assumption when uh, you, you made a statement, but it, it is that and then some. Uh, I actually tackle, like to tackle this thing um, going back because of the disrespectful nature of the human organism. Um, that I think the humans uh, think that they were at the top of the, the food chain. The food chain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. They, yeah, they, they say... It, it, Literally, like if you go on Google and you Google in uh, the most successful species, right, humans put themselves at number 10. This is ridiculous. Wow. Yeah, they put themselves at number 10 when the most successful species is the worm. And Interesting, need, the worm. Yes, the worm is the most successful species. And in terms of uh, land animal species, the oldest. It's almost a billion years old. The worm is wow. almost a billion years old. And in terms of understanding what human domestication is, I want to go back. I want to start back because we can start back with um, bacteria and dementiality. And let me say this, too, because I want to set the tone and then I guess um, anyone who wants to uh, uh, ask questions on, on the on dimensions as we go along, feel free to shoot the question and I'll try to expound more. But I want to set the tone before I go into the the domestication aspect on dimensions. And and I want people to walk with me in my perspective on dimensions. And I'm not saying that my perspective is the correct way, but this is what now makes sense to me because I used to look at it the way most other people would look at dimensions. And, and dimensionality is broken down into five dimensions. We're actually moving into the sixth dimension, and let me explain that. There are five dimensions. Monera, prost protesta, fungi, plants, animals. We are now moving and creating. As we now speak, we're creating artificial, which is the sixth dimension. Those are the six dimensions. It is now my, mind, my perspective and my mindset now is that the idea of dementiality, how we, or most people commonly speak about it, um, has been a, a way and an aspect of domestication in terms to throw people off so we, don't, we no longer recognize. It's like a David Blaine magic trick uh, that has been done by those who understand the rules of engagement. But now, you know David know. Blaine's uh, sleight of hand is pretty good. Oh, absolutely. He is, it's, it's, he's, he's immaculate. I can appreciate <laughs> I can appreciate his sleight of hand. Very, very good. You know what I mean? So 
taking that same concept and, uh, uh, of the blame trick and applying it, we see it every day. So the dimensions are important to understand. And another thing in regards to dimension, and I want to say this as well, too, uh, and I had this conversation on another platform uh, last week, and I had said that what if I told you that humans, or well, not humans, just animals, fungi, and plants are clones? And uh, the, the host asked me, well, what, like, what am I talking about? <laughs> that when I say that these three species are clones. And I said, well, it's quite simple. I was surprised, too, when I looked at the scientific evidence. But they don't word it as a clone. What they do say is that there is Monera. Monera is the single-cell organisms, and then there's Protesta, the multi-cell organisms. Right. And the multi... Yeah, pardon me. Um, amongst the several species of protesta there is there there are they're broken down this is several uh many different types but you have protesta that are animal like fungi like and plant like they're very clear in the scientific literature they are like them or like us but they are not us Two distinct, different things. You can clone somebody. They'll be just like you, but not you. Okay. So, okay. That, so when I say clone, we are like the protester because that's where we come from, and that's where um, mitochondrial DNA originates from. So we are like them, but well, we are sense. Not, not them. So that's what I say when I say we're clones of, that's what I mean. So I started looking at these things as dimensions, and we've been given a storyline of, oh, uh, well, uh, we're moving into the fourth dimension and the fifth dimension, but I, it, it appears to me that, that that's the way to throw people off and not really look at what's um, really important is the evolution of, of the species on this planet. But you do that when you're trying to domesticate, and you're trying okay, to create so a new reality. So when you're saying the dom domestication, you're meaning that's a way of um, keeping people locked in a mind frame or inside of a cage, so to speak? Yes. Yes, I am. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So what you saying you jumped over the fence? Yeah, I jumped over the fence, man. I jumped over <laughs> the fence. Uh, I said I'm going I'm to... Gonna... I'm going to look on this other side. But I, let me tell you something, Shemaya, because I have some really interesting things that I'm talking about, not tonight, but uh, on a, it, it's not time yet for me to to share that information later on. But um, it's a really fascinating thing. I came into these by building geometric shapes. And that's how I tell people all, all the time that I, I was educated by you know, all of the geometric shapes that I build. And people are like, you're educated by shapes. So I said, well, because you don't engage in consciously in dealing with angular momentum and angular momentum of all of the geometric shapes, then you would never really understand what I'm talking about. It just seems foreign or I'm talking some, or trying to be mystical, more mystical right, right. than it needs to be. And, it, and it's not that. It's we don't even pay attention to the geometry of our own face. The reason why you function the way you do is based on your geometry of your body, your nose. Your nose is very important, and it's a, a, a tetrahedron, a three-sided shape or similar to uh, a side of a pyramid, you know what I mean? Right. Your nose, you know what I mean? So how you breathe your breath plays a huge part in how you process information, and most people don't take that into consideration. Yeah, or do a lot of shallow, shallow breathing, so to speak. Absolutely. Here's something else most people don't recognize. In our bodies, the kidneys, you know, and the kidneys play an important part, of course, in flushing out a lot of the waste. There's um, structures known as the renal pyramids, and the renal pyramids and I 
put emphasis on the word pyramids. They're actually yeah, I was going to say that. So I'm imagining inside the kidney there is some pyramid-shaped type of gland. Yes, yes. They're, some people, and, they, and we all have different ones. Um, you know, not, not, when I mean different ones, of course, we will be all different because we're different organisms. But what I mean is there's anywhere in a range between 6, I think it's 6 and 18, somewhere around there. So some okay. people may have 8, some people may have... 16, you know what I mean, or 18 or whatever it is. I think it's 18, 18 or 16, I, I can't recall offhand. But nonetheless, not everybody has the same amount of renal pyramid, and they vary. So um, that's important as well, too, to understand that. And when I said um, to someone last year um, that you can tell uh, which way your energy or your spirit is moving based on urinated, they looked at me as if I had six heads. Well, yeah, that's not normal conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's not like everyday talk, like you, you see the Knicks, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. That's, so, that, so you, that, that is correct. So, yeah, some conversation got to be appropriated for the audience that we're dealing with. <laughs> no, no question, no question. You know, I guess they didn't expect to hear that, although we, we were talking about spirituality and things of that nature, and I was just like, well... Oh, okay, so the context of it warranted... The context uh, was... It, okay. was, it was appropriate. And I, I, I don't burst out in these kind of things like in the middle of... I guess of I'll be on the subway. Did you ever consider <laughs> to the man in the corner? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But... No, it, it, it was a strange thing, and um, I actually woke up in the middle of the night, and around, around March of last year, and um, actually in between March and February, around this time last year, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and something said, you better go look at kidneys right now. So I, that's how I was able to go ahead and research okay. about the kidneys and, and know everything. And then I would just happen to be of course, relieving myself in the morning, and I noticed how urine comes out. And when you pay attention to your urine, you'll notice it's a double helix. Right, right. like the DNA. Like the DNA. Um, and then I kept paying attention every time I urinated. I don't know why I was compelled to do that, but I kept doing it, and then I noticed that the stream reversed in the other direction. Normally, it goes in one direction. But at certain times, your urine will change. It's almost like the Nile River changing direction. Um, and I wanted to see if I was able to find out whether I can pinpoint at what time, points in times throughout the day that this happens, but it, it kind of varies and jumps around. So... That's where I came up with the concept. So I actually got other people to to, to monitor their own. So you urine. got your little study, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I got to do this. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to be the only crazy one. So right, 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 right. <laughs> so all five of y'all. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, just pay attention. And then surprisingly enough, these people come back had come had come to me later on, like, yo, you're dead on with that. You know, you know what I mean. So. So it gave me a little bit of um, confidence in the idea before I started really spewing that out to other people out loud, like in a forum like this. I can say that with some conviction with people. Because you got a study you know. behind you. Yeah, I got a, I got a, I got a miniature study behind myself. <laughs> now, let so, me ask you a question uh, with regards to that. Now, what? In addition to doing, being a, Je a Jeopardy question, or, or I don't, I don't want to trivialize it, but um, by knowing, being equipped with that information, that dispends. Uh, uh, different directions right. according to the time of day or what latitude. Uh, I know you didn't use those words, but where, what location you are in the world or the time period. Being equipped with that knowledge, how does that advance us, or what? What, are you, what would you like the audience to get out of that information? Ah, uh, what's important about understanding your spin? And let me say this about spin: for spin. Uh, going one way. One way is a contractionist way. One way is an expansionist way. What we're now talking about, really, is love. And love, the process, 
not what you see on TV or two people hugging. I am talking about a process of contraction and expansion. So okay. the importance of understanding your spin is to understand wh where your body is at a specific point in time. Most of the time, you're going to be one way, whether you're an expansionist way. Like if you're moving from right, if your urine is moving in a direction, it's easier for men to do this than it is for women. Women would have to sit and either have someone videotaping their urine coming up, yeah, coming okay, down. Or, videos, man. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, it's you a PG the, show. <laughs> oh, yeah. You about mirrors and buckets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep it as G-rated as possible. Understood. Um, um, but for males, they can see it a lot easier. If it's moving from right to left, you're talking about a contractionist en energy where you're trying to have, I always say trying to have an experience when you're contracting. When okay. you are expanding and moving in the other direction, then you know your energy is emitting out. So you kind of understand this. And if you're dealing, if you're dealing, say, for instance, you're about to go into a heavy meditation. You go to urinate, and it's moving from left to right where you're trying to expound out. That's, I think you would have a much higher experience because your body energetically, your urine is telling you where you are at that specific point in time. Not that it would be hard for a person to have a, an enhanced experience, but your experience in moving from right to left. But if you had, if you understood that when you're urinating and it's moving in the opposite direction, it would be much more profound experience. Okay. So that's the importance of understanding that kind of the science of understanding when you're contracting and expanding, and that has to also do with the heart too. The heart operates under those same principles. Um, contracting, expanding, and then you have that intermediary state, the normal heart, the normal heart state, then it moves in one direction, then moves in the other direction in terms of what's going on or what the experience is. The heart is the intermediary between the brain and the gut. All of Very them have neurons. Yes. Because uh, uh, they said that what the gut is like the, the second brain, so to speak. They call it the second brain. Keep in mind, um, the brain, I don't really even like to call it the second brain. Um, it's one brain because when we're uh, during gestation period, the brain and the gut come from the same embryonic tissue. Yeah, this and is true. They, they all you unfold the little twisty, twisty pathway, so to speak, and fall in sure. shape. That's right. Sure. Absolutely. And, and they're connected by the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve connects the brain to the gut. And, yeah, and any know. type of emotional um, dis-ease will definitely uh, cause your heart to shut down or you to fade out or dizzy out. The, that's interesting because there's a, there's a lot of interesting nuances about, um, like, the heart. Like, what people don't recognize um, is that the heart, and I, I, I know – we're, we're, we're talking tonight about human domestication, but this, what we're talking about is also encompasses aspects of how people manipulate and use human domestication. So when you're talking about heart, I've, I challenged women, some women last year, and I asked them, are you heart-loving or are you brain-loving? And they were like, what are you talking about? You know, I said, well, how do you know you're identifying with your heart? No, most of us don't know whether or not, because we're taught, it's, a, it's almost like a sound bite. Oh, I, I'm passionate about something. I'm speaking from my heart. Oh, are you? Very few people, in my opinion, actually do. And, you, and when they do, you, you'll, you'll know. And how, how I can say that unequivocally is the brain is, well, let me say this, the heart. 500 times more electromagnetic than the brain. They this both have neurons. Huh? I said this is true. Yes. So when they've done the studies, I was looking at a study that they did in, in Europe, and they measured that heart, and they said the heart was the, uh, from the individual that they were testing, 
um, expanded its field up to 50 feet. Now, imagine an individual that can do that. The brain can't do that. You know what I mean? So when right. a person... Right, right. When a person is captivated, an audience, and pr- people are in awe at that and particular point. they're open to that, you, yeah, exactly. That's heart-loving. That's heart-loving. Let, Somebody's talking from their heart. Let, let so, me ask you a question. Sure. Now, with now, regard with to heart, that, being heart-loving, um, we're, um, what do you call it, uh, human domesticated to uh, naturally, uh, we have our amygdala, um, some people call it the R-complex or the reptilian sure. complex, that's automatically in, innate to be in fearful mode, you know, for protection, for, for uh, protection purposes. So now with that being the premise, uh, when it comes to being really heart-centered and really loving from the heart, that amygdala, um, out of protection, a lot of times limits people to really do that, that 50 feet expansion because either someone's going to break your heart, so to speak, and then you may have a, uh, not a metaphor but a literal heart attack and or um, someone uh, mistreats your your emotions, and so then you go into protection mode, and after a period of time, you you only are brain centered. So how do how do you work with that with human domestication for people really to step beyond the fear stage with using their real heart centeredness? Ah, ah, very good question. I can appreciate that question. Most people are not educated; they never are in tune with their heart. Let me say this, and then I'm going to directly answer that question you just said. The heart emits also oxytocin. The brain emits oxytocin. Both do. So when we're talking about love, which is that bonding hormone, I challenge people on whether or not they're truly heart-loving or they're being domesticated through their brain, which is very important for when women give birth. If they are programmed, and this, this is now dealing with your question in terms of uh, the, amygdala, the amygdala, the hypo, the, hypo, the hypothalamus, hippocampus, all of these glands within the brain, uh, in particular the hypothalamus, which deals with hormones, you know, uh, that, that are, uh, and, and, that are emit, emitted throughout our body when we have experiences, you would need to actually set up a system to domesticate people in order to control their brain so they don't identify with their heart. So you give them an idea of love, like you watch love on TV and people say, I'm sure you've run across this many times in your life where people be like, you know what, I want to be just like these people. I want that kind of love like I see on TV. So they aspire to that. That's a program. You're not experiencing the process of love where I give you, you grow, you give back to me based on your learning, and I grow. That's love. That has nothing to do with TV. It has nothing to do with it, – it, it, and it doesn't mean, like, if somebody did something to me based on a society, society standards that we would deem bad, then – but I grew from it. That's love. It's a process, contraction, expansion. I give you, you give me. And as long as that process keeps going, we're operating under love, not what we see on TV. We've given storylines, a mythology, like the Egyptians' mythology, to what the idea of love is. So in terms of uh, when someone protects themselves and the the amygdala uh, responds in that way, um, that's based on a, a learned a learned response over millions of years. Of well, doing without this. question, and once that cortisol shoots in that bloodstream, it's a wrap. You can't even think. Your, your blood drops from your brain. You're not thinking properly. So your heart centeredness. So what I'm hearing from you with the human domestication, we have a million years of um, survival mode, so to speak. And now with the introduction of uh, this new modern term, it may not be modern, but modern to the most people listening, human, human domestication, creating a new vein where they can uh, become heart-centered and um, not be fearful of it being stepped on or being abused. And in the event, I'm sure there's someone beating you up and bushing you in the head with a hammer or something like that, um, <laughs> or physical abuse. You know what I mean? i got to be extreme, too. You know, it, being extreme in my um, example, short of that, you know, physical violence, um, I can't think of the uh, the one of the ancient people that said that uh, 
really in life there's no meaning except the meaning that we put to it. Yes. And it's kind of yes. what I'm hearing from you with the human domestication as far as being willing to uh, uh, contract and to expand at the appropriate time. But I think most of the time we're uh, on autopilot, so yes. not even having time to even explore or expound on these type of conversations or even thought patterns. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, we are always of the moment, never in the moment. That's to be able that again? To, I said we are always of the moment, but never in the moment, meaning that you can see everything. You see what's around you, and you pay attention to everything that's around you. We're always of the moment. Just We're just of the moment, never in the moment. See, when you're in the moment, you, you see and you, you, you pay attention to all the nuances. When you're of the moment, you're just doing. You're on. You're operating on a program. You know, just part of everything. Okay, okay. I got you. You know, so um, it's an it's an interesting dynamic. But human domestication. Uh, some people would think that it started, you know, with other humans domesticating other, you know, other humans. And um, I'm saying that it's a bacterial thing. That evolved. I was, and, and, and I was just reading your mind. I, was, I said he's probably going to say something about bacteria or fungi or something like that. <laughs> I, I believe it or not, I was thinking that. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a bacterial thing. You know what I mean? And the intelligence, that's where the respect comes in. We have become disrespectful. And now, I think there, what, is, what has happened o- over a period of time, and um, I think what happened is we, we've kind of maneuvered into a two-part process based on uh, the universal process, or I should say uh, the solar system process and okay. the angular, mo- angular momentum of the Earth. You know what I mean? Um, the Earth, first and foremost, I, I, I need uh, the listeners to um, understand this when we deal with the planet Earth. This is where angular momentum comes in and where I think people need to pay be more respectful to angles, and please do not dis- dismiss. If you hear somebody talking about pyramids or geometry, you think it's some fuddy duddy thing and you don't take it serious, I-, I would caution a person, please take it very serious. It's funny, you, you keep your thought too, Garth. When you say angular momentum, my mind is going directly to astrology, not like what you read on the um, in the Sunday yes. papers. Um, I'm yes. really thinking ancients and how the angular momentum determines the, uh, the beha- behavioral influences on people by you have these grid patterns over one another, and it um, that's really going to the whole DNA and, and, and that, that resonance. And it's really interesting. It's fascinating to me. So maybe me and you may be the only ones appreciating this. But, um, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 no. Oh, no. Let me tell you something. When I'm, I, I, what I'm about to get into in terms of angular momentum, every person of you, if you are wise, you better take heed to what I am going to say. Failure to do so, you will get what you deserve. And that's what it is. I don't wish that on nobody. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. But look, we, we have to, it's not even wishing. I'm not wishing anything on anybody. You know what I mean? Let's get right into it. Okay, I'm going to start with the earth. The earth has three different um, angles in which it deals at. 22.5 degrees, 23.5 degrees is which we are at right now, and then 20, excuse me, then at 24.5 degrees. And over periods of time, these kinds of angular momentum change. So that means that the sun has influence, different influence over each period when the sun's tilt or angular momentum shifts from any one of the three positions. That's hugely important. Now, I think during one of these shifts, something happened. And just like anything in any system, nothing is perfect. Although we think of, when we, uh, when we think of the process or what we call God or whatever as being all perfect, again, when you have an idea, you are trying to mold it. You don't know. When you, especially when you're moving from scratch, you're like, man, I don't even have a starting point and I'm not, I don't know anybody else who's even thinking along these lines, where do I begin? So you just start fishing around until you make sense of something, and then you start building, and you have a foundation, and then it goes, oh, you know, larger and larger and larger. 
what we need to verstand about angular momentum, and please, everyone that listens to this, listen very closely, because people of hue, well, all people don't, most people don't really understand and understand their skin tone, but people of hue in particular, heavy concentrations of that brown stuff we call melanin, think that, okay, I'll go out in the sun at any given point in time, and I will get the, enough vitamin D. But if it's true, that vitamin D, if, if it's true, if it's true that um, uh, we could go out in the sun at any point in time and get vitamin D, then why, why is the uh, people of Hue really deficient? in vitamin D, in particular in this country. And there's, there's a number of reasons why most of us are indoors most of the time. So we, well, some we of lack... Some our livers aren't functioning properly? That's, well, if you ask me, that's the biggest problem. I was asked that yeah. question a couple of months ago. What's wrong with our people? I said because we're vitamin D deficient. But here's the thing. Here's the skinny, as they say in uh, corporate America when they're about to say something. Here's the skinny on uh, when they're going to tell you an insider secret. Here's the skinny. Here's the skinny. The sun has three. It has three levels of uh, of UV or ultraviolet radiation: UVA, UVB, UVC. UVC does not penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. It is very all. All are pretty dangerous and harmful because they are, play a huge part in um, mutation. UVB. And UVA does break the Earth's atmosphere. UVA always penetrates the Earth's atmosphere. Now, if there's clouds, UVB won't penetrate through the clouds. But UVB is what gives us the vitamin D production. Now, how? Why is that important? Because not only that, and then how? What is your source reference to to get there? To get to, to get to UVB, I'm about to tell you that right now. Let me say this before I get there. Most people, and I've spoken to people of Hugh this past winter when we had some really nice sun, and I saw them on the Facebook saying, hey, I'm out here getting the sun. I'm out here, I'm loving it up, getting that vitamin D. I said, hold your horses, cowboy. <laughs> if it's true that in order to get vitamin D, the sun must be at an altitude of 50 degrees altitude. You're not getting vitamin D. You're getting sunlight, no question. That means you're getting a heavy dose of mutation. But because you're dark skin, it's harder for you to mutate than it would be someone of a lighter hue who will get heavy inundation of mutations going on within their organism, which is why people that we call Caucasians get cancer, that UVA tears them up, or any one of the, the UVs will, will tear them up uh, more so, so they don't need to be out in the sun as long as someone of darker hue. But the key to understanding vitamin D is your angular momentum needs to be at 50 degrees or higher. That will start come March 21st, so you can have the hottest day, 70 degrees. I'm not coming so you're talking to you about the equinox. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Sure. The spring equinox, that's when it will start coming back to 50 degrees, which is why, and this is important. See, for years, I, I, I felt incomplete, and I got, we've, we've, we've been given some outstanding information into melanin, but never how the sun actually functions with melanin and how to look at um, the sun. We just said, at least what I've heard, I don't want to say that any, I don't want to, uh, you know, put what I've been told and, and what I've learned from others about melanin and sun and our interactions with the sun on to anyone else because you, you, many of your listeners may have heard what I'm speaking about have done if they're researchers they've probably run into this information but um 50 degree angular momentum 
pulse, the production, which first starts through the kidneys, and the kidney starts the process of free vitamin D after a certain amount of time in Caucasians. It starts about 10 minutes, and then it starts moving into the full production of vitamin D. So not only do you have to understand 50 degrees altitude and higher, where UVB is, you, you, have to, you have to understand your skin color. Your skin color would also dictate to you how long you need to be out there. So because I am a darker hue than you, Shemaya, I need to be out longer in the sun at 50 degree altitude than you. So this way your, our bodies can actually keep a storage. We operate just like plants. We need to keep a storage of vitamin D throughout the spring and summer months up into September 21st, because I clocked this last year. September 21st, it'll stay at an altitude of 50 degrees for literally like maybe an hour or less. After September, from September 21st, you may get an hour. September 22nd, you'll get less. And then it starts into the 40-degree altitude and going lower and lower and lower. That's, and where the sun, the sun, that's where the Son of God dies, huh? Yes, that's exactly Exactly okay. right. Starts to die down. So just like the plants go into hibernation, we do as well too. So we need to accumulate as much vitamin D as possible. But see, then what happens is when you're trying to domesticate and you understand this and you remove people from nature, which the, which the Egyptians did a fantastic job of doing, you know, in terms of educating the people, and because today when we look at back at ancient Egyptian culture, we say, well, our ancestors did this, and I agree with all of that. Our ancestors did this, but I look at it from a point of domestication because if it's true based on the doctrines that I've come across and laid my eyes on, if it's true that the Egyptians actually, those who came into what we call Egypt now because there were people living there, and then there was a group of people. If the if if the if the history and the story is true, right? If the story is true, if the story is true, if, if the story is true um, that's only basically because none of us can say unequivocally this is what happened because we weren't there. Um, right. But if these stories are true from multiple star sources, especially within uh, the, the conscious community, people like I, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, um Dr. Clyde Winters, any of these people who have put in their doctrine that civilization was started from a group known as the Ma'a Confederation, also known as the Fish Confederation, five families, just like five dimensions, five families came out, which were the Dravidians, Ethiopians, Egyptians, Manding, and Elamites. And they all went out into different directions, probably handed with the same science, came, and they understood uh, uh, how, do you, how we call uh, our artificial construct. They, they understood that um, and implemented that to those people who were more in tune with nature. So... It was easy to manipulate people, and, and, and you can kind of see that when you read these texts, when they talk about if it's true that the Egyptians said, hey, uh, they utilized mythology in order to get the people to buy into their religion. So that means that they created a storyline in order to manipulate people to buy into their religion. That's domestication. You can't tell anybody cuts the cake. That is domestication. If I have to manipulate you, so in other words, and I, when I was having a conversation with somebody, they was like, well, they were uneducated. I said, you have no proof that somebody is uneducated. That's like you going into the wild, coming out of a, a city, going into the wild. You have no education of the wild. doesn't mean that you're stupid. You're just not familiar with the ways of those people who live in a jungle or a forest. Right, this you know is true. I think, I, this is true. I think a lot of times when um, it comes to the theory of uneducated uh, especially in our day and age with iPhones and, you know, you got Androids and things of like that, technology seems to be the rule of the day. 
So if you could put an airplane in the sky or a spaceship or whatever that is, then you're intelligent. Because uh, going back to the very beginning when you mentioned about the worm, I think it may be a little difficult for many people to see how the worm would be very intelligent when it doesn't have a skyscraper or it doesn't have a 4x4 four four truck or it doesn't have a subway or, <laughs> you know, or some other type uh, of uh, uh, vessel to move around in. You know what I mean? Well, here, here, let me help let me help those who who might find the worm not intelligent because now uh, we're going to expound on that. Uh, that 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 concept of the worm not being intelligent. Do you know? Since the worm was here first, worm. I want to give you some of the stats. The worm has no eyes, a brain, and five hearts. No lungs. Breathes through its skin. Keeps a mucus layer on top of it. Been here for almost a billion years. But that stuff might not be sexy. For most people, uh, whatever you're saying, Boris. <laughs> what? Who cares about that? It's more like I can't believe I'm still listening to this program, but I'm gonna hear him out. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, but but here, let's. I want to take it to because people would appreciate it if I'm coming from an Egyptian standpoint. Understand this: the reason why Kemet was called the Black Land, not the Brown Land or the White Land was because of worms, and the worms laid down their compost, which turns black. See, when you look at soil, soil has different gradations of color when you pull it up Num from a number of different things. Number one, the top layer being that organic matter, and then they, it runs in, in, into a different horizons. And after the organic horizon, you have the A horizon, B horizon, C horizon, and what affects a lot of that, number one, is moisture, water. Number two, sunlight. Number three, organic matter. So when you look at the organic matter, which helped the worm, let me explain this to people. The worm helped create this. The worm is our domesticator. You and I would not be able to eat fruits if the worm did not lay down law the way it did. Cleopatra herself laid down a decree. And for those who research it, please do research it. She laid down a decree in Egypt. If anybody removed the worm, it was a problem for that individual. You were yeah, not off with that head, huh? <laughs> yes. So fruits, vegetables, and we have to understand, too, because plants are very fascinating. Because then we have to look at the plant kingdom too. We I can't neglect them. We got to be very respectful to the plant and the fungi kingdom, because the fungi is larger than both plant and animal kingdom together. See, human humans are at the bottom of the animal chain. So we we just think we're so, we're more sophisticated than them because the breath now is different. Right, right, exactly. Animal. Yeah, right. So, and for those, what I mean now that the breath is different, I'm talking about the ear content, how the ear is. This is how you want to domesticate and control people is you distract them with a pseudo-reality. And those who understand the rules of engagement, angular momentum, color, those people understand, okay, we are going to balance the environment how we see fit. Some people will flourish, others will not. Most will not. And those who are, what you do is you can control every environment based on the dirt. That's how they do it. They, it's they funny you control. say that. My mind, you got my mind going so many different places. Like one, <laughs> yeah. I mean, in a good way, not a bad way. I know. Um, sure. I think it's up in the Andes Mountains somewhere. I was reading it a while ago. Um, I don't speak Quechua, but it's something to do uh, in English, like a black dirt or black soil. But um, it's the ancients of that time or that day, like thousands of years ago, they uh, made a particular soil up in, in um, like, you can probably Google it, black dirt, like Peru and Bolivia, that area, where uh, it made fruit and vegetation um, have such a, 
not just an um, edible appeal, but the, the nutrition value was so much better than other parts of the world. And when you talked about the Nile and Cleopatra with the um, uh, with the with the worm and the decree, uh, it, it kind of took my mind right back there. Uh, um, the the black soil, I know in, in modern in Spanish and Negro, you know, but um, right. This, the, 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 this was, if you like do a search, and I think you would find that very fascinating. This particular uh, uh, area where this, they're not quite sure how the ancients of that day made this particular uh, soil to be self-regenerating, and uh, it's well, just real black, rich dirt soil for uh, agriculture. I'm not quite sure if they uh, still use it. Uh, I think it was, I don't know if it was Stanford or one of those other universities. If I, It's been a while since I was researching it, but they went down uh, South America to investigate, the, the uh, I guess, the, the mythology and came across this really special soil. And uh, and the only reason we're talking about it because you kind of brought that up with the worm and stuff like that. But Well, I'm uh, familiar well, with that. Because my brother oh, okay. actually, All right. yeah, yeah, I'm actually familiar with that story. A couple years ago, my brother, he... He must have been. He must have found that same information, and he brought that to my attention. Then he was like, "Yo, you should look that up." And um, I never got an opportunity at that time because I was so heavy into the Cambodia stuff to uh, to go into it. But we had touched on it, and now um, I'm like totally devoted to you know looking at the environment and the soil and how there's brown soil. There's all different types of soil, and Soil is also important and part of the domestication. But let me also I want to I want to stay on the worm because I'm hopeful that I can get your listeners to at least really yeah. consider the worm. Now, I'm not <laughs> done with advocate. that worm. Yet. You're not talking about no uh, fishing hook either, huh? No, I'm not talking about fishing hooks. But people are gonna I'm gonna say something else about the worm. A couple of things because they, they I want your listeners to really feel where where I'm going with this worm and. This is not about, you know, following or believing anything that I'm saying. You can research it and totally see what I'm saying to be lawful. The worm not not only laid down the groundwork for angiospermic plants, because we have to be respectful to the plants, because the plants have been around for a long time. Okay. Yeah, angiosperm. That's all the fruits. And keep in mind that the gymnosperm, which preceded the angiosperm, and it was during the uh, the the gametophyte, the gametophyte is a, a, a type of an, a gymnosperm that you know they have like ferns, uh, conifers, and stuff like that. There was, I think, it's a type of conifer that um, actually m- must have mutated and spawned the angiospermic plant. Now, this is, uh, this is important because when I was doing this research, if someone would have bet me that the fruits, flowering plants, the fruits and stuff was here longer or, or, or a fruit eater was here before a meat eater, I would have said, I'd take that bet any day. But that's not the case. So it gives a different perspective on meat eating because the meat eater was here before the fruit atarian would have been. Okay. Based on evolution. If it's true. If it's true. Now, I'm, 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 now, now, speaking on that, you mentioned the other uh, from the um, ancient Kemet or Tom Mary yes. or Egypt, what we say today about the different, the, the five families, so to, so to speak. So what I'm actually hearing that there are different uh, so-called uh, species of hominid, you know, um, like we're, we're we're allegedly called Homo sapiens sapien, uh, the wise ones or, or whatever like that. So, could it be possible that a, a different species or a different type of uh, body type of um, uh, so-called man or woman um, fit in that category as being meat eaters, and then another model of a uh, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. human? Oh, oh no, no 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 no! This is question now. That's all. No, 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 no. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address that. I'm, I'm glad. See, you're skipping ahead of me there, Brother Smyre. You're skipping oh, ahead of me. <laughs> I'm going to deal with that hominid stuff. Don't worry. I'm gonna get, we're going to get to that homo sapiens sapiens. Because, see, you, your listenership, will ha- we will have a newfound respect for this worm. I'm not done. Now, I, I'm not done. Let me say this. You ride with the worm. Okay. <laughs> yes, all this with the worm. 
and insects in general because, see, what, I, I want people to also, while you're respecting the worm, respect the plants and the fungi kingdom. But I want to say this about the, the, the plants, in particular the angiosperm. Now, see, the gymnosperm, which is a naked seed like a pine cone, you know, which means that their seed is exposed, these uh, kinds of plants and trees dealt with the process of uh, wind blowing the pollen around and stuff like that. So that's how they reproduced and they, they, they spread their doctrine like a religion. That's the way I kind of look at it, them spreading their that's doctrine. That's a good analogy. Uh, yeah. Say it again? That's a good analogy. Yes, yes. So when, when the angiosperm started to make rise, it needed to compete. You know what I mean? It needed to compete. And if you study plants and trees, if you're not of their family, they compete and they grow taller and bigger and wide, you know, wiser and trying to fight for sunlight and, and nutrients. So how does this new form angiosperm make its expression felt? Ah, the intelligent angiospermic plant realized, hey, I see these insects and stuff flying around here, like over a hundred million year old bee wasp mix. Is a bee wasp mix that they found, and if it's true that the angiospermic plant of the day created an alchemy of perfume to get that bee wasp mix to come and pollinate it to help spread its doctrine. After a period of time, the bee and the wasp become two separate entities. Bee is a bee, a wasp is a wasp, but it started with the bee wasp mix, and that bee wasp mix was a meat eater because they found a trap in amber, and that's what, that's, what, that's what the contents was in the organism. And therefore, we are left to at least assume or theorize that that species manipulated by the plant to create, as over a period of time, two different species, of course, other factors being involved, light, mutation from the sun, environmental conditions, all of these things, creating the two different species, wasp and now bee, and now you have the most prolific pollinator on the planet, the bee, now spreading the doctrine of the day to all for all these other plants to flourish on the continent. This is huge when we think about it, when you think about it from this perspective and being respectful to the what the plants contributed, the angiosperm, and what the bee has done in terms of spreading the doctrine of the day in order to uh, help the angiosperm lay down. But we can't forget the worm because the worm was doing all the neural networking, laying down different, um, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, pathways, neural network and subway systems in the dirt in order for rain to come in and help nourish the ground. So we wouldn't have a lot of these fruits without of these, this whole ecosystem working in such a fashion. How do they get the intelligence to do that? But if that's not enough, and I know that people saying, I don't want this biology lesson. No, let's take it to the mythology. I'm going to fast forward now. This is now we're coming near to where you you just spoke of moments ago. When we look at Egypt, what do they have on their what animal do they have on their headdress that that, that you notice? Oh, well, they got the vulture and the uh, the the the, uh, the cobra. The cobra. Say the serpent, right? Even in Indian culture, they deal with the serpent energy. Correct. You know, that serpent. I'm saying, what I'm saying is that ancient Egyptian culture, those who laid down civilization, those are not those people. You, don't, you wouldn't see those people. Those people. <laughs> yeah, they people, don't come out much, huh? They're behind the scenes. They're very behind the scenes. They <laughs> educate the pharaohs. Because it is, I am saying, in my opinion, that the pharaohs and many of the head figures were like actors of today. They were setting the trend for people to follow. But those 
who understood the science came in as David Blaine types who understand nature and are able to manipulate because they understand alchemy and how the body works at a different level than most people, and they can make you think something is happening because they understand alchemy, and then right. we call it magic. No, so I now... Have, uh, I, I, huh? a, a brief definition of alchemy probably be help, helpful for those who are not familiar with that. Uh, uh, alchemy we... is nothing more, and I'm going to keep this as simple as possible, you want to know what alchemy is? For those who who uh, ever had you had tea, you see the contents of your tea, and you take it in water. You take two substances to make something 